Genesis chapter 3. We begin reading in the first verse. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than any beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childhood, childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living, and the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam, and his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to God, the way to the tree of life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your holy, inspired, life-giving, infallible word. We ask now the Holy Spirit, he would come and help us understand and apply it. May he be glorified in doing so. The Lord Jesus, amen. What I'd like to do today, and uh, God willing next week, is look at the cross in types and in shadows. Uh, The Old Testament might be a foreign book to many Christians, but it was the Bible of the early church. The New Testament, not 
yet being written. And so when they came to their towns and cities and families and friends and people they met and wanted to tell of the gospel, the scriptures they turned to and the scriptures they proclaimed about the Messiah were found in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. What we read in our Bibles is that the cross of Christ was not something that God turned into an idea while it was happening, think, thinking, Let, let's do something called redemption while we're at this. Things have gone horribly wrong. Let's try and make the, something good come out of this. But the Bible says of Christ that he was slain before the foundation of the world. What that means in terms of words that we can express as finite creatures is that in the eternal past, God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit had a council meeting and we read something of it in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. And there it was decided that God would make creation, that he would create all things that uh, the Lord Jesus would come to planet earth and become a man uh, because of the fact that man would fall. Given the opportunity to do so, he would take it and fall. It was not a surprise to God at all. And that's why in the council minutes it would read something like this. The father saying, my plan is to create a people for my son and I give them to him and in time he will come and redeem them. But it will mean, son, that you come to this world and that you make atonement for sin. And the son in the eternal council meeting said, I will go. And it's as if the father says, okay, Holy Spirit, write that in the minutes. Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In Genesis chapter 1 we see creation, in Genesis chapter 2 we see the more detailed description of that creation of making man and woman, and then by chapter 3 we have this serpent described, and he is called the crafty one, he is uh, the one who deceived Adam and Eve, first Eve, and then Adam with full knowledge taking on the requirements and the temptation of the serpent and eating. And the fall is given as something that Adam did rather than Eve. So we have creation, we have the fall. It's interesting as we read through this passage, we're reading something that because we know how the book ends, the Bible ends, we know who is being spoken of here. It's veiled if you were to just be reading Genesis 1 and then 2 and then 3 because what we have in our Bibles is what we call progressive revelation. We learn more about God by the end of the book than we would have known if we had no book at all or simply had just read the first few chapters. And in reading the book as a whole we find that the serpent is described as the devil. The book of Revelation spells that out. For he is the one who was here in the garden. But in this fall, which was tragic by our standards in the sense of uh, the whole creation was plunged into ruin, death is because of this. There was no death at all before this event took place. As a Bible-believing Christian, I have to affirm that there was severe consequences for this action of Adam rather than there'd been millions and millions of years of death and destruction anyway and now uh, the, the father was just making it official. No, there was a consequence to this sin and it was death. The wages of sin is death according to Romans 6.23. But what we have here in this passage is the first question, at least the first, uh, the first recorded question in the universe which was a question from the devil to those in the garden. Did God really say? King James, hath God said? And it was a sinister question, seeking to undermine the word of God. Satan's strategies have not changed. Why change what supposedly to him is a winning tactic? He questions the word, the word of God continually. He batters our mind with questions and doubts and harasses us with those questions. And he did so here. 
Did God really say? Questioning whether God had made his will known. But what we have here too is the first mention of good tidings, good news. The heralding of what is called in theology the Proto-Evangelion, the first mention of the Gospel. And it is in the context of words spoken to the serpent. The first promise of the Gospel comes as a curse on the serpent. You read of it in verse 15, where he's speaking to the serpent, says, I will put enmity, animosity, hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So what was a curse to the serpent was a blessing to the seed of the woman. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Normally we would think of seed spoken of as the seed of the man. And there is, I think, more than a hint of something that in time we'll come to understand as the virgin birth. A seed given to the woman. Uh, by miraculous conception. So it is. The seed of the woman will, will come and he will do something to you, serpent. He will crush you. He will bruise you on the head. Yet, he will be affected. He will be bruised in the doing of it also. So, in this first mention of the Gospel, in the immediate aftermath of the fall right here in the Garden of Eden, a promise is given to the serpent that one would come who would crush his head. Ken Ham writes this, right after Adam's sin, which separated him and all his descendants from our Creator, God revealed he already had a plan to provide a way of salvation for sinners. You understand when God would ask of Adam, where are you? It's not because he lacked information. God knows all things, but he was wanting Adam to admit exactly where he was. And so we have progressive revelation. And here we have a picture of the cross. And in terms of the first mentioning of the good news, it's in the context of Christus Victor. Christ as the victorious one who will come and lay hold of the serpent and defeat him. He will come and crush the serpent's head. As we move on in our Bibles, I'd like us to go to Ezekiel chapter uh, 28. Here we see something dramatic from the Word of God. As you read through the Bible, if you've never been shocked and stunned by it, you've not really understood it really, because it is a stunning revelation as we go through the scripture. And here in Ezekiel, we're just wandering through the passage and reading of a particular city in the uh, ancient world called Tyre. It was a cosmopolitan city. It was a place where business was done. And yet there was someone who was ruling the city. He is known in some Bible texts as the Prince of Tyre. Other translations describe him as the leader of Tyre. And then we see something dramatic. I would like us to go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Read with me in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the leader, the prince, the the ruler of Tyre, this city, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God and sit in the seats of, seat of gods in the heart of the seas, yet you are a man and not God, although you make your heart like the heart of God, behold, you're wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. I don't know if sarcasm is dripping from the prophet at this point. By your wisdom and understanding, you've acquired riches for yourself and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you've increased your riches and your heart is lifted up. Pride was his issue. Because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. 
They'll bring you down to the pit, and you'll die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of your slayer, though you are a man and not God, in the heart, hands of those who wound you? You will die the death of the uncircumcised. That's a reference to those who are without covenant with God. By the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Here then is this leader of Tyre, the one that was visible to the community of Tyre. And God's assessment of him was that he has a proud heart and that he, God, would bring him down. And would he, uh, though championing the fact that he thought he was a God, would he still be saying that? Because God assesses him as simply a man and will bring him down. But what is interesting in this passage is that two personages are addressed. The first person, addressed from verse 1 through 10, he was the leader, he was the prince of Tyre. This was the visible ruler. Every decision he made affected the people under his rule. Yet from verse 11 onwards, it's as if the veils lifted and were able to look into the unseen spiritual dimension. A second person is now addressed, someone known as the king of Tyre. This is someone who was not seen. This was someone who would not be known to the inhabitants of the city. And there's quite the contrast between the leader, the prince of Tyre, and the one described as the king of Tyre. And things, hear this, things are said about the king that could never be true of a mere earthly monarch. Verses 13 and 16 tell us that this king was in the Garden of Eden. And verse 14, that he was a cherub, angelic cherub, and was cast out of the immediate presence of God. Most biblical scholars I know believe the person in view from verse 11 onwards is none other than the devil himself, the one behind the scenes, the true ruler of the city of Tyre. Let's read in verse 11. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. I have turned you to ashes on the earth. In the eyes of all who see you, all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You've become terrified and you will cease to be forever. Interesting. Very, very interesting. The book of Revelation describes someone known as the serpent, the great dragon. He was thrown down, that serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. This serpent is a murderer. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. But he's no match for the Lord Jesus. And if we look at that scripture we've uh, already mentioned, Genesis 3, 15, it's not the woman who conquers, but her seed. One is coming who will crush the serpent's head. Derek Thomas writes, When Adam and Eve failed to obey the terms of the covenant of works, 
God did not destroy them, which would have served justice, but instead revealed His covenant of grace to them by promising a Savior, one who would restore the kingdom that had latterly been destroyed. God's method of grace is costly. The heel of the Savior will be bruised. Clearly, this is a metaphor that in the context... It is to be contrasted with the blow the serpent receive, uh, receives, the crushing of the head. But it is immediately apparent what this involves, the shedding of substitutionary blood. That seems to be what lies behind the provision of animal skills, uh, skins as a covering for, Ma- for Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. This uh, innocent animal slain in the place of Adam and Eve. And this was a great mercy. Instead of Adam and Eve dying on the spot, an animal died on the spot in their place. A picture of the Lord Jesus in what he would do for us. Christ would come and absorb the wrath of God due to us. And that's why we read in the New Testament, Colossians 2, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us, forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, that's the whole law system, to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. It could be translated through him, through it. It's not absolutely clear what is the best uh, translation at that point. But the message is this. In the physical realm, it looked like Jesus was the public spectacle. But if the veil could be lifted, and if we could see beyond the earthly to see what was happening in the heavenly realms, Jesus was not losing on the cross. It was not the end of a dream. It was not the end of his ministry. He was winning, winning, winning. He was absolutely dealing a death blow to the devil and all his minions. It was at the cross where the decisive blow was made. God had given Christ victory over all his enemies and did so there at the cross. And God being God conquers in ways we would not think would be the wise way to do things. God has a success rate of taking the nobodies, the no ones, and using them. Those that think they can do much, God uses them little, but God can do a lot with those who know they are nothing. One of the things God does with His man, His man of God in both Old and New Testament is wean them off of self-reliance. The Apostle Paul had everything in terms of education and the ability to speak and yet he came to Corinth in weakness and fear because he realized he could not do anything in terms of a spiritual deed. He could not awaken dead people from their sleep. He needed God and he knew it. So it is. And so, how would you overcome a dragon? The great dragon of Revelation 12. God says, I know. How about this? Let's conquer the dragon, not with an equal or slightly bigger dragon, but let's do it through a lamb. Oh yeah, that's God's sense of humor. I think, I think it's more than that, it's God's way of doing things. The thing that is seemingly obscure, God says, I will conquer through the Lamb. And the book of Revelation 12 verse 11 talks about believers in this context where the dragon is mentioned and said, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives even unto death. God destroyed the enemy of our souls by means of the Lamb, defeating Him for eternity. Another view of the cross in the Old Testament, and we go through this very quickly, is Noah's Ark. Man had become very rebellious. It didn't take long for the whole world to be affected in terms of what was happening in human society. Very quickly after the fall, in fact, the next chapter reveals the slaying of Abel by his brother Cain. 
And sin advanced to the point where every thought of every human being on the planet was only evil continually, and God brought this flood to the earth. Even now, it's uh, easy to see how this could take place when we look from space at the earth. 70% or more of the earth's surface is covered by water. And we find even uh, findings of uh, fossils halfway up great mountains in the earth like Everest. And it's not because fish jumped. It was because I believe there was a worldwide flood. Evidence is all around us. Billions and billions of fossils that tell us of a soon catastrophe. If an elephant was to be taken for a walk and somehow died on the walk, it would not turn into a fossil unless it was quickly covered by water. And what we find in the record of the fossils is that while one particular fish is halfway through a meal, it was covered by water and a fossil emerged. It was not like it laid itself down slowly, came to its end, and then over time became a fossil. It was right there, abrupt, where the fossil record tells us death came very, very suddenly. So, I am one who says the Bible's true. God has not given us false revelation. The Bible doesn't start becoming inspired after Genesis 12 when we get rid of the silly stuff. But it's inspired from the very first word of our Bibles. So Noah's Ark, what was that? That was a provision of God for those that God had chosen who would enter the ark. And he had the animals in the ark. It was not this little tugboat that was just this small thing and very, very hard to get the animals on. Uh, there is a lot of research being done to show that all that was necessary was, was included in this vast ark that Noah built. And there was a doorway. Not much is spoken of it, but there was certainly an entryway. And this was the only place of rescue. Once Noah and his family and the animals were safely insi inside, the Bible says that God shut the entryway behind them. Genesis 7, 16. King James says the Lord shut him in. And that doorway is, again, a picture of the Lord Jesus, who in John 10 says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Again, a wonderful picture of the fact that while all others deserve and are under the wrath of God, those who enter through the door, the Lord Jesus Christ, have eternal life and are rescued. The book of Romans chapter 5 tells us that, that Christ came to save us by means of what he did from the wrath of God. And that's what it means to be saved. When you uh, talk to people and we use that word saved, we use it in a number of different contexts. You can use it in sport. A goalkeeper in a hockey match will make a save. Same in a soccer match or football as they call it in England. A save. What do they do? They don't bring the team to some eternal cosmic event and we're all singing hallelujah. That's not what usually happens. What happens is someone has tried to score a goal against our team and the uh, the fact that they were trying to do that, should they succeed, it would be a calamitous thing. We don't want that to happen. And the goalkeeper saves us from, th from that. He saves us. He rescues us from something. To be saved is to be rescued. And the ultimate rescue is to be saved from the ultimate calamity. And the ultimate calamity is to stand before God without a saviour facing the just anger of God due to us because of our sin. We've sinned against a truly majestic, holy, magisterial God. And this is high treason in the sight of God. And God could justly do what he did in Noah's day and just wipe us off the face of the earth. If he did that, no angel 
would be uh, making placards to say, come on, bring some more redemption. We're not going to sing any more worship songs unless you do something for this Adam's race. No, if God brings justice, all the angels of God rejoice in the justice of God. What they're shocked by is redemption. What they're shocked by is a ransom pay. God never became an angel to rescue angels. But God became a man to rescue the sons of men. And that is an astounding, astounding revelation from the Bible. So Noah's Ark tells us that a doorway of the Ark was shut. And there will be a time when those who have heard the proclamation can hear it no more, either at their death or at the second coming of Christ. The book of Hebrews makes it clear there's a pointed time for everyone. It's appointed for every man to have death and then face the judgment. A third aspect that shows us Christ in the Old Covenant, especially the cross, is God's covenant with Abraham. If we turn to Genesis chapter 15, I'd like us to do this. If you know me, you know I've got uh, much material up here. I've got enough for probably two or three hours for the next three days. Two hours every day for three days. <laughs> so we're just going to stop when uh, you look like uh, you can't take any more, which could be another 30 seconds from now. <laughs> but in Genesis chapter 15, God had called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans. My sense of humor kicks in when I think of that name. Isn't that a great name? Ur. Where are you from? Ur. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Let's write that down. Yeah. Ur. That's where he came from. And God called him out of idolatry. God called him out of uh, false religion. And there's no record that anyone in his town were ever converted other than uh, he being called out by God. And God started the race, well, I won't use the word race, the, the offspring of Abraham, let's put it that way, the Jews, by means of Abraham. There's only one race. God became a man and he didn't say, okay, which of the races will I become? I know, I'll become brown so I can save Asians. He became a man and in becoming a representative of Adam, he's able to save all of us because God recognizes only one race. That's a good place to say amen. Amen. There's a race to say amen. Amen. Now, in a covenant, when God called Abram out, he made promises to him, and it was amazing that he would do so because God is infinite. Uh, Abram's very finite, of course. It was the, uh, the, the, the one who had everything, making a covenant with him who had nothing to offer. And in a normal covenant, which is a very strong agreement, more, uh, more strong than we can uh, really grasp in the Western world, to fail to live up to your side of a covenant usually meant certain death. Marriage is a covenant, according to the book of Malachi. i uh, very, very thankful that it is a covenant in God's eyes, and He is joined to it. But in the covenant, two parties would normally uh, discuss the terms and then make their particular oaths of their side of what they'll do in this covenant. And in Genesis chapter 15, we read this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abraham, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abraham said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Okay, I love the fact that you are saying these things, but can you kind of give me something rather than mere words? And Abraham said, "Since you have give, been, since you have, uh, Abraham said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Then he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Look at verse 6. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. What did he believe? What God had said. What God had revealed. And he, God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. <clears throat> this is a verse that is 
picked up by Paul in the book of Romans chapter 4 when he's announcing the fact that this gospel he's preaching was not new. In fact, the Abraham, who was the Jew of all Jews, the first Jew, was justified in the sight of God this exact same way by simply believing, by believing what God had revealed. I don't believe Abraham knew what we now know in full detail, but what he was given by revelation from God, he believed, and on the basis of what Christ would do in the future, righteousness was transferred to his account. We should not scoff at that because they say, well, Christ hadn't come yet. Well, Christ has come. And we are justified the exact same way by the same person and work of Christ. Though Christ came a thousand and more years after Abraham and justified Abraham, so a couple of thousand years after Christ has come, we're justified by the same person and by the same work. We believe God and God gives us righteousness as a gift which is our standing before God. There is one gospel from start to finish. In Old Testament times and in New Testament times, no one gets in the kingdom by their actions but by Christ. Christ is the Savior so that in heaven there'll not be an old covenant service and then afterwards after a Hebrew coffee break there'll be a Gentile service where we we'll be singing different songs. No, Abraham and Adam and Samson and David and Ezekiel will be joining with John the Baptist and Paul and Peter and we'll be singing worthy is the Lamb who was slain for by his blood he has redeemed us out of every tribe, tongue, people and nation. There'll be one service because there's one Savior who saves the exact same way by grace alone, through faith alone, in this Lord Jesus Christ alone. Abraham not knowing all of the details we now know, believed what was revealed to him and God says on that basis I give righteousness to you. That's your standing. I reckon it, I impute it, I count it to you as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, Oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Just uh, as an aside, that seems so strange to our Western ears in the 21st century. Oh God, how do I know I'm going to get this? I know you're promising it, but how, how do I know? Okay, here's the deal. Get a three-year-old heifer, a, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. That'll answer your question forever, right? <laughs> really? For Abraham, he knew exactly his question would be answered immediately. God was going to make a covenant with him. These uh, animals were going to be used in a covenant ritual sacrifice. And that would be more than enough to assure Abraham of God's promise. Look what we read, verse 10. Then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two. Though the words are not said in the text, the obvious implication is to cut an animal in two meant the death of each of these animals, right? And laid each half opposite the other. So on, it's as if there's a trail, and on each side of the trail were the carcasses, or half the carcass, of each of the animals. One side would have one part, the other side would have the other, and there would be this trail. And in a normal covenant ceremony, each of the two parties would together walk through that trail. If you imagine this aisle being the trail, they would walk through that trail together, and they would point to the carcasses, and they would say something like this, God, do the same to me if I do not honor my side in this covenant. May I be like this animal. May I be like that animal. May I be like this one. May I be like that one. It was a serious thing. Wouldn't that be interesting if we did that at weddings today? <laughs> in fact, that is why there is the giving of rings because in ancient times the finger was cut to show the seriousness that there would be this scar 
on at least uh, the, the, the husband, possibly the wife too, to show the fact that they were in a covenant with someone. And rather than uh, us doing that in our day, rings are a lot easier, though they are expensive. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to walk through a ceremony where we don't have uh, sharp knives in place. Okay, would someone... Uh, uh, best man, have you, have you brought the knives? That would be difficult. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now, this is interesting because... Abraham wanted to see this. You bet he wanted to see this. God was making a covenant. He was going to answer all his questions forever by this covenant. He, he wanted to, 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 to see God. He wanted to see him do this. He wanted to have something in his mind that would be forever eh, 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 just there in his mind, never to be taken away from his mind. But I believe it was God who made Abraham fall asleep at this time. He wanted to stay awake, but God put him to sleep. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, now, when did he say this? While he's asleep. <laughs> know for certain, that's what you can do with a covenant. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. How did God communicate this to Abraham and Moses write this down? Well, Moses wrote what was revealed to Abram. Perhaps after he woke up, God walked him through what was said. I don't know, but somehow it was made clear to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, that's Egypt, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Verse 17. Now, I want to read this because it's an interesting fact. Dr. R.C. Sproul was once asked what is his favorite Bible verse. And he'd never thought of that question before. He loves all the Bible or... Uh, all that he's read of the Bible and never been asked that question before. What is your life verse? He didn't know what to do with that one. And uh, people asked him that question. And when he thought about it, what he wrote oftentimes uh, by his own testimony was this verse we're about to read, Genesis 15, 17. And he would sign his name when he'd written a book and people asked for him to, to sign it. He'd say, uh, he'd write R.C. Sproul, Genesis 15, 17, and people think, oh, that's wonderful, that's, that's great, till they got home and looked it up. And when they got home and looked it up, they thought, did he, did he, did he mean, did he get it wrong? Did he mean 17 verse 15? Did he, uh, is he dyslexic? I mean, what, 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 what? That's, that's the verse, R.C. Sproul, Genesis 15, 17. And he said on a radio program I heard, no, I didn't stutter, I didn't put the wrong verse. This is my favorite verse in all the Bible. Let's read it. It came about when the sun had sat, set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that's his favorite Bible verse. Oh, he said it's loaded. It's absolutely loaded. In this covenant that God made with Abraham, God put him to sleep, spoke the words of the covenant, and through these uh, smoking oven and flaming torch, it's obvious it was a way in which God was revealing himself. He's not either of those things, but it was a way to make clear God himself was walking through the pieces and making covenant. And this was speaking of an unconditional covenant. It was God who was saying, I will act. I will keep my promise. You, you can stay asleep. You can sleep through the ceremony. In fact, I will do it with my own integrity in place. 
I will say to the Caucasus, may I as God die, which by the way is impossible, but may I die if I do not keep my side of this covenant. It's an unconditional covenant, Abraham. And R.C. Sproul realized that that is exactly what we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God says, I will act. I will send my son. He will live the life that you should have lived. He will die on the cross, the death that you deserve. I will raise him from the dead. He will be ascended into the right hand of all authority. It will be all my acts. Salvation is of the Lord. You can stay asleep in terms of your activity in this salvation. This is God at work. Salvation is God's work from start to finish. Not dependent on human merit, human works, human this, human that human willpower, but God's activity from start to finish. Wow. So I read verse 17 and I say with Sproul, that's an amazing verse. I'm not sure it's my favorite yet, but I know, I'm, I'm, I'm trekking with you. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing this is an amazing revelation of unconditional love, of unconditional promises made to Abraham. And that's what God has done for us. God has not said, I'll save you if you do a certain thing, if you achieve a certain task, if you... No, I will do it. I will give you repentance and faith as a gift. I will cause you to want me. I'll take out the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. Recognizing this, hearts of stone don't sign up for transplants. We don't want it. We don't want a new heart. We love our sin. We love darkness rather than light, the Bible says. But God says, I will awaken you. I'll give you life where there was no life. I'll cause you to know my voice. I'll cause you to walk in my ways. And you'll be able to see the beauty and the significance and the magnificence of the Savior because I unveil him to you. Peter was able to say, after the question was asked, who do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. Jesus said, you didn't get that from cassette tape of the month, from CD of the month, because prophet so-and-so has said it. You didn't get it because it's been passed on to you. You're blessed, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And that's the basis on which I'll build my church on the revelation given to Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church isn't built on Peter, it's built on Christ. And Peter's testimony was Christ himself is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And God says, on that basis, on that rock, I will build my church. And hell's strategy will never prevail against it. Wow! Praise the Lord. I could get excited, but I realize I'm in church. So, <laughs> Praise the Lord. God says, may the same thing happen to me as these animals if I break my part of this covenant. And Abraham got the pieces in place, but then was put to sleep by God, showing this was all God's work. And God swore to do all that was necessary for the covenant to be fulfilled, typifying salvation. I think we're going to stop there. There's much more we want to say, I want to say about prophetic fulfillment, but seeing Christ in the Scriptures, but we haven't even got out of the book of Genesis. We haven't got to the Psalms. We haven't got to Isaiah. We haven't got to the sacrifice of Isaac. We're going to see it next time, I believe, God willing. Would you pray that God will open up our eyes to see the beauty and the worth and the immensity of God's covenant with us the cross was not an accident. It was planned by God in eternity past. And he made it very, very clear how we would recognize the Messiah when he came and what he would do when he came. And Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment due to us was upon him. And by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. This is the message of the gospel from start to finish. I wonder where you stand. Have you entered through into the ark? Have you uh, embraced Christ? Have you seen in him all that is necessary and sufficient to save you? If not, call upon him. Turn to him. Return to the Lord and find his favor. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for this wonderful gospel. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Help us to see him more clearly, Lord. Open up the text before us so that we might see him in ways we've never seen him before. Cause us to rejoice in our God and his sure and great salvation. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.